next speaker this evening is Brooke Baldwin from the class of 1997 to hear about her path from Westminster to CNN. Brooke is a Peabody Award finalist who anchors the 2 to 4 p.m. edition of CNN Newsroom. She is also the creator and host of CNN's digital series, American Woman, which focuses on the stories of trailblazing women who have broken barriers in their respective fields and are now helping other women do the same. Brooke has been at CNN since 2008, and in addition to her two hours in the studio each day, she's often sent into the field to cover breaking stories in the United States and around the world. She played a key role in covering the 2016 presidential election, and she's also reported from Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. In 2016, Brooke traveled to the Persian Gulf for an exclusive embed opportunity with the U.S. Navy, reporting on the war on terror. She traveled to Kenya ahead of President Obama's historic visit and landed an exclusive interview with his half-sister and grandmother in the Obama family ancestral village. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me just say that I'm excited for your wife, too, and <laughs> she's a lovely lady. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here back home um, in Atlanta, in at Westminster, and thank you all so much for coming out because I know the weather is not awesome. Um, uh, I will start by saying that walking back into Robinson, I don't think I've been in this building since 1997, which is where I took AP Calculus with you, Walter McClellan, <laughs> in perfect handwriting. And um, no, and I'm, I'm sure so many of you all took similar math classes and you become successful doctors and engineers and lawyers. I'm proud to say I took calculus and became a journalist. <laughs> um, the last time I was actually here speaking at Westminster, Keith uh, asked me to speak at commencement. This was like roughly three and a half, four years ago. And so that was an, an era of, of our lives, which I referred to as BT before Trump. <laughs> we'll get into that in a second. Um, but first, I am such a proud Southerner uh, living in New York City and I sneak y'all in every so often on TV, accidentally, on purpose. And um, I, I love that we have this shared experience, right? Like within these hallowed halls, learning things like leadership and perseverance, and I was my senior class president, and I was a peer leader in sports and that kind of thing. But I think what I really, what really seeped deep into my pores being here at Westminster was the intangibles, fairness, listening to both sides, acceptance, which little would I know would bode me extraordinarily well for what I do each and every day. And Keith, I'm going to give you credit because it took you all 20 years to, to nail this, but love, challenge, lead, change, that is what I was learning here, that is what we have learned here, and as much as I loved Mrs. Schwartz downstairs and calculus, like that's what I really took away with me. And so, um, from Westminster, just a little bit briefly about me. So I graduated here in 1997, and then I went on, I ended up in, at UNC Chapel Hill. We're playing Duke tonight, go, go Carolina. Go, go. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, from Carolina, I majored in journalism and Spanish, and then went on to this, you know, career that landed me first in Charlottesville, Virginia. So in TV, if you want to be on air, um, it's so not glamorous, first of all. <laughs> and there's like 200 TV markets, and I landed at 192, which was Charlottesville, which is an awesome little town. But basically, I was like going to work at 2 in the morning on a Friday and Saturday night when my friends were living in the big city and calling me up from the bars. I was like, can't talk, got to go to work. And was writing my own show and editing and, and like rolling the teleprompter with my foot, okay? <laughs> you don't want to know what that's like when you roll it backwards. So, so then from Charlottesville, I move on to West Virginia. So I'm in West Virginia, Charleston, Huntington for three years. Um, had some lonely times. My mother, who's here, thanks mom. Um, we had one Christmas, like, took pity on me, and so she sent me the best Christmas present ever, ever, which was my brother. <laughs> so, you know, two Westminster Wildcats, like, stranded in the hills of West Virginia, <laughs> foraging for Christmas dinner, which was literally frozen chicken and trying to figure out how to make stovetop stuffing, which we bought at the 7-Eleven. <laughs> um, and then I move on from West Virginia to Washington, D.C., which was a whole other, like, trial by fire, became this uh, crime reporter 
um, and really learned actually a lot about breaking news and moving fast and also really listening to my photojournalists. These are these like veteran guys and gals who have seen it all and they really put me in my place and I really learned like I'm not the story, let the story speak for itself. And then from Washington, I landed at CNN, which being from Atlanta, you drink Coca-Cola and hopefully you watch CNN. <laughs> and so I, I came to CNN 10 years ago, first here in Atlanta, so I got to come home and was a correspondent and always had a bag packed and then um, ended up with my own two hours uh, about eight years ago and have managed to hold on to it since. And every single day, it is an honor and a privilege to do what I do, every day. Uh, little did I know when I was here at Westminster like, what my future would hold in terms of meeting presidents and interviewing too many parents who've lost their children to senseless gun violence while someone decides to shoot up a school as I'm on the air or recently sitting uh, with Stephen Colbert on his show as he's asking about my, my, my women's series, American Woman. Like, pinch me moments uh, in so many regards, and it's been an amazing journey so far. And a lot of people ask me, like, what is my day-to-day -day like? How do, how, do, how, do I, how do we cover the news at CNN? And I'll lift the curtain for you. And I also get a lot of, like, what's it like to cover the Trump White House? So here's... You can ask me questions later if I don't cover this. But um, so essentially my day is, so I'm on every day from 2 to 4 in the afternoon. And that doesn't mean I roll in at 1 o'clock and read the glass. <laughs> um, that means that I'm up at 6.15 in the morning. Um, I give myself about an hour to scan the newspapers. I probably read a li little differently than you guys, but basically I have my Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, Daily Beast, CNN.com, Twitter, my like, was where I'm scanning. And I'm reading to not only like know what the big story is for the day, but also I'm scanning for really interesting names or ways to make my two hours unique with fascinating guests that can, I can draw something out in them that you guys will learn from, right? Because you can go to Twitter, you can read online, but it's, you, 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 wanna, you wanna hopefully flick on the TV to see something important and unique and somebody opine about something interesting to you. Uh, I hop on the phone around 7.15, 7.30, with, this is my first call of the day with my executive producer. He's like my co-pilot, we've been together for eight years, he's my work husband. And we talk about, we make sure we have the same brain in terms of what we want to cover for the day, who we want our guests to be. I hang up, there's a team meeting, then at 9 a.m. I'm listening to our network-wide call. So the network-wide call is led by my boss, who's the president of CNN, who's Jeff Zucker. And he kicks off the call, and basically it's a, it's a global call, so people are tuned in all around the world to hear where we are as a network, where we're focusing our resources, like next week Trump's going to be in Vietnam, so we'll listen in to see where we are within Vietnam and who our players are, correspondents, what the threads are, what we think is going to break for the day. It's kind of, that's like a real lift the curtain and be ready for certain things kind of call. We hear, we hear how we're going to cover stories digitally because that's fascinating as opposed to TV. I'm always really interested to see like which stories are doing really, really well on digital that may not be that mainstream you would think of CNN TV story and I personally like to cover those. I like to give people a variety. Um, then I head into hair and makeup at 10.30 where I look nothing like this <laughs> and it's the magic room for a reason. While I'm in hair and makeup for 45 minutes with a woman on my face and another woman on my hair, I'm listening to a producer brief me for that time to just bring me up to speed on what I've missed, what guests we're currently booking, so I'm ready to go when I'm done with hair and makeup. So for then three hours out of hair and makeup, I'm at my desk working with re like reporters, <coughs> writers, producers, my executive producer to fill out the show. So we have this like structure of a rundown in the computer system. We have this new software. But so I believe the, the viewer is smart. I believe the viewer knows that if I show up and just read questions that people write for me, that that is obvious. And because I went to Westminster and learned to do my homework, <laughs> I do my homework every day. I feel like I need to read extra just to bring it here if like Wolf Blitzer's here. <laughs> and, um, and so then like 10 minutes tell air, take my jeans off, pop on a dress and rock and roll. 
Um, and so that's essentially what my day looks like. Obviously each day is different. Obviously two, yesterday I think it was, this huge New York Times 20 page story drops, 10 minutes before my show, and everything changed. Um, I, I traveled to the Middle East. In fact, I went to the Middle East with my friend Bobby Rashad Jones, who was also here with me at Westminster, class of 97, who I did a piece on here at Westminster about like a person who changed my life. Someone at the Pentagon happened to be watching CNN, ringed me. I end up in the Persian Gulf seeing how he operates. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> um, but my job changed drastically in June of 2015 as a man by the name of Donald J. Trump <clears throat> rolled down that golden escalator in Trump Tower and every day, every hour, every five minutes can change. And it's because of a White House briefing when we had those or a presidential <clears throat> tweet or the latest Kim Jong-un summit it can change on a dime, and, and you just, the teleprompter gets blanked, I'm looking at black, I get two lines in my ear, and I go. And that's when the homework comes in. So I should know what I'm talking about, who I'm gonna get to talk to, like they'll say, for example, with, taking yesterday with this, with, this, with this New York Times, actually today, um, we found out that the Mueller investigation is basically done. And so, if it breaks during my show, the teleprompter goes blank, I know in my ear they tell me what guests are about to join me, and most of the time I see them, like, when, when I see people running towards the set, that's when I know, like, it's about, it's hitting the fan momentarily. <laughs> I got, like, a three-second heads up, and then we just roll with it. Um, and, you know, a lot of people stop me and ask me, like, how do I do it? And my job is just to cover the news for two hours a day on a global basis. But my job is also to hold people accountable who are in power. And the President of the United States doesn't seem to always like that, but it's not up to him. Um, I'm not here to be his friend. I am not here for him to like me. I am not here to be bullied. I am here to do my job, and I think the audience gets that. Um, I also get asked a lot about how I feel about fake news. Um, it's not in my vocabulary, not in my lexicon. I don't use it. Uh, I first, first of all, I think fake news is something that he doesn't like. And secondly, I think, um, I know that research has been done. I was listening to my boss talk about this. So research has been done, and not only has the phrase fake news not negatively impacted us in our brand, actually more people are now coming to us and trusting us. And our reporting should be right and accurate and fair. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Are we human? Yes. Do we acknowledge them? Yes. Social media also has a huge impact on our national discourse. We look at President Trump's own Twitter feed, 58.4 million Twitter followers. So he's really played a major role in elevating the platform. And then I think a lot of people, this is what I've been told, a lot of people go to Twitter now to see what's going on, but they come to CNN to see what's true. It's an extraordinary time in journalism, and it's also an extraordinary time for women. Uh, I will say that covering the 2016 campaign and what really gives me inspiration every day is young women, young people in this country, and also just young women who were at so many of these rallies I was sent to and being then at the Women's March and feeling that and the women in Congress, like look at the faces of you know the 116th Congress and so I had this whole idea and I banged on my, my boss's door and I said, I, if something is happening with women in this country, this was early 2017, this was before Me Too or anything like that, and I said, please let me cover women in a way that our network really isn't. And they said, yes. And so I created a series called American Woman uh, where initially I was featuring more famous women, 
Ava DuVernay, Diane von Furstenberg, uh, Issa Rae, Betty White, <coughs> who, you know, we talked about sort of their career arcs and then how they feel about being in America, being in America as a woman in this time, and actually how hopeful they are, and be almost because of the man at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, that has galvanized so many women, which is an incredible thing. You know, I was just here last summer at, at Stacey Abrams' house interviewing her because then my next piece of this whole series became uh, women running for office and how this unprecedented number of women were running. And I really wanted to understand what was behind that. Um, and Stacey was part of that for me, uh, talking to Republicans and Democrats. And to be honest, like I was sitting in this the you know, cornfields of Ohio with this uh, pro-Trump Republican millennial woman who was fascinating, who was so wonderful and let us in her home. And I'm, I'm frustrated for her that there aren't more Republican women running and being out there and they're working on that. Um, but, you know, who knew, like looking back at my time at Westminster in the 90s, kudos to this place in terms of women for making, I mean, coaches, teachers who instilled in us as young girls that we should be as tough and as smart and as athletic than the boys. And they didn't have to do that, but they did and they still do. There are so many things about Westminster, especially as I'm now getting older and I have friends who have kids here and the more I hear about the school and like the expansion, I just went in the junior high and been in there, it's so fancy. <laughs> and, and there's so much about this school on paper that's super impressive, right? Like where, the kid, where, where students are going to school and increased diversity and state championships and test scores, but it's the, as I started out, like it's the intangible thing, it's the, it's that this place sees beyond the curve of change and equips students to really take on the most unforeseeable, unpredictable, extraordinary circumstances that life has to offer. Case in point. So, thanks Westminster and calculus. <laughs> I think if we had a president who maybe didn't make the Department of Justice question a lot of motives and things and maybe some financial decisions and family members doing things that we are yet to fully comprehend, I think, you know, if it was policy and he was a president and was acting like a leader, we'd be having those conversations. Right. Except, you know, I started watching Vice uh, news. Just, oh, just, good for you. you know, I mean, this around. is what's going on in Syria. <laughs> this is what's going on, you know, across the world and stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, I just had a whole conversation about, you know, Syria. I, I talk about Syria all the time and ISIS brides and, you know, Senator Lindsey Graham dropping the F-bomb in Munich last weekend because he's irked that, you know, Trump wants to withdraw troops. Like, we have all those conversations, too, you know, but... Oftentimes, Trump, he, he, he makes the news. He makes the news, yes. Okay, I'm too tired to ask a smart question. Oh my um, you, you mentioned that at one point you always had a bag packed and ready yeah. to go, so what was in that bag? <laughs> Good, because uh, I never knew if it was like a natural disaster or I made a suit. Gosh, what was in that bag? It was a while ago. I mean, it's basically what I would pack now, like go cover a hurricane. It would be like um, a strong set of boots, that could like handle nails in a tornado, but also water in a hurricane, but also, then I would have a pair of sneakers, jeans, waterproof kind of REI top, uh, something that looked nice here up, and a ball cap, and a reporter notepad. Yeah, yeah. Are you able, ever able just to disconnect and relax? And I'm, I have, 
I find meditation is an answer first thing in the morning. I like I have a hard time, but, but from not immediately pulling my phone, you know, like instead of saying hello to my husband in the morning, I, I'm <laughs> doing other things. Um, I would say meditation, definitely time with friends. I was just over the long weekend in San Diego with Catherine Bean, wherever she is, and another girlfriend of ours from, from Westminster, just to like try to put it away. And um, I like the shower because no phones are in there. <laughs> it's hard to turn it off, I will admit that. Yeah, yes. Uh, do you know Maria Reza in the Philippines, and what do you think of what's happening to her? I don't. I'm, I actually don't. I could talk. I mean, was very familiar with the former leader who was slaughtering his people over drugs, um, but I don't. She's the head of Rattler, and she's being sent to prison by Duterte's regime. It was Duterte's like it. been murderous? Yeah. It's it's a uh, so she's being basically put in prison for doing journalism. Do you, do you feel that there's a threat that something like that could happen here? Um, Hopefully not here, but I think that is a global threat as more and more people are coming down on journalists, which makes me feel, I think, all of us more empowered and, and realizing that it's never been more important, the roles we play, but certainly around the world. In like places like the Philippines, you think of places like Russia, um, state TV, uh, it's awful, but I'm sorry, I don't know that specific case. I don't want to, <coughs> yes, yeah, yeah. How did you know that you were interested in journalism? Um, I always really enjoyed, like here, I remember loving English. I remember being comfortable speaking in front of people. Um, I remember always just being a curious person. And, and um, but that never, like, I was aware when I was here at Westminster of some interesting women journalists who I was um, impressed with, but it wasn't until I would say college I actually interned at CNN where the bug bit in terms of hearing the clickety clack of the keyboard and realizing there was all this like incredible energy <clears throat> piercing this place that I wanted in on and I actually always wanted to be a producer. I wanted to be behind the scenes until like spring of my senior year. And then I, you know, it's funny you meet people who come along like season reason lifetime, right? And there was this one PhD student at UNC who sort of grabbed me and was like, "Why are you hiding behind the camera?" I was I was like the camera operator at our student TV show, and he said, why are you hiding behind the camera? You have this presence and this voice, and you need to try out to be the, the little college anchor. And my parents can attest to how big of a deal it was, like, huge, huge, <laughs> huge <laughs> that I got that, and that it just all kind of took off. So I always then, from there, I always knew I wanted to be a journalist, but the hard part was never knowing if it was going to pay off. Yeah. Yes. So as you look at the other news stations, yeah. I'm curious, um, I, I was reading something recently about sort of the, the way you guys all work together at CNN, and there's a lot of mentoring and yeah. friendships and such, but do you have a similar extended um, network of folks that like you're really close with that I mean are is there a, a friend for Fox sure I think I think especially this time has really bonded us I mean I was just having dinner the other night with a girlfriend who wrote uh, who was embedded on Hillary Clinton's plane is a big writer over the New York Times we all it's yes so I know people at Fox I have friends at Fox I have friends at MSNBC my closest friends are at CNN just because they're right around me but yes Yes, is the answer. So over here, yeah. Yeah, you kind of uh, touched on the uh, Trump era and how chaotic it can be reporting. Yeah. Uh, could you go into more, like, how predictable was it before the Trump era where the White House seemed to have like their photo op and their uh, little uh, catchphrase of the day or whatever yeah. that they wanted to promote? Was it pretty predictable at that stage? What I think. I don't know if predictable is the right word. Gosh, let me think for a second. It's hard to like remember what happened a week ago. Um, it, the breaking news then was something like, something awful like, I, I think of Obama, I just read Michelle Obama's book, right? So she, so reading about Newtown, for example, something as horrible as that, and then how the White House responds to that, or Obamacare. But we didn't know what direction that, that, that was gonna go at the time, but it was just less, Frenetic. Do you get any kind of 
preconceived message from this White House like you maybe used to get from the um well no you know what? it's a good question we I, I never got so we have people who cover the White House right and then we have all these producers and all these people in Washington and they have all these amazing sources so it doesn't matter the White House we have people who get a sense and, and then I get a sense that there's sort of an idea that there's going to be a rumbling of a something breaking and then all the, the people over here above my pay grade over here are trying to figure out, um, you know, <coughs> when within CNN they can go with the story and then when they can start letting people within CNN know to prep us. Like if something major is going to break, like major, major involving Washington, a few people will have a heads up. Oftentimes, as the anchor, I won't. I'll just know that be prepared for something to drop, but that's rare. Most of the times, it's genuine. It's happening while I'm on air, and we just roll with it. But I think because of our sourcing, no matter the administration, although, gosh, I'm, I'm going to contradict myself now in saying that there just seems to be more surprises now. <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, even though you have your own show now, do you still struggle as a journalist with being able to cover stories that you feel are important to cover versus stories that your producers tell you that your viewers want to see? Sure. Of course. I mean, I fight for something I really want to cover, and most of the time, I win. But it, it, it will involve a fight. Now, I, and not like a, I mean, like I said, my executive producer and I, we, we really have this like mind meld thing. We've been doing it for eight years. He knows what kind of stories I like. But there are certain days where we just have to, like it is meat and potatoes kind of news. There is no room for, I mean like, I don't even remember the last time I did anything fluffy, but like something lighter, uh, which it's not light, but just not maybe Washington centric. And I feel like actually my show is known for that variety in a way that other shows aren't, uh, and I'm, I'm fortunate in that way that I get to sneak a couple other stories in there. I think that's why people watch me, hopefully. Yes? Do you still think about going behind camera? Um, I would consider down the road producing <clears throat> something bigger and longer where I don't have to be in front of the camera. I just don't yet know what that is. Longer form program? Yeah. Yeah, more time. Give me more time to tell a story. Yeah. Yeah. What journalists do you admire and look up to? What about them? Do you feel like? So, let's see. I personally know like Savannah Guthrie, Gail King. I love Gail. Um, right. So is my I wife. had breakfast with her two a month month and a half ago, and she is exactly who you think she is. Awesome. Um, I really loved, like, Diane Sawyer to me was just this, like, <clears throat> woman who embodied such grace and gravitas and was serious, um, but not <coughs> this. Um, what else do I love? Like, Dana Bash is our, one of our big political correspondents in D.C., and she's a girlfriend, but I just really respect her. <clears throat> Wolf Blitzer's like my dad. <laughs> my, it was my wedding in May, dancing with me. I mean, he's amazing. Um, who else? Yeah, Gail and Savannah. I think Savannah's done an amazing job with that show, given, given everything that's happened. Yeah, anything else? Yes. Who are one or two interviews that you hope to do that you haven't done? Michelle Obama. I mean, who's read her book? It's just incredible. And Michelle Obama, because what she, who she is as a woman, how she gives back to girls, how she feels about her girls, growing up in Chicago, like, it's an incredible book. Um, I would say Michelle Obama and, uh, can I be light and fun? Like, like, like Lady Gaga, I think she <laughs> I mean, I think it's so fun being at CNN and being able to ask these smart questions of anyone. So some, some like really famous people don't want to do us because we're going to ask them about 
what's happening in the world, right? Not just like, French dye your hair. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, Lady Gaga. So excited for the Oscars. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Do you have a favorite for 2020 right now? Oh, wow. <laughs> this is all I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I feel like, let's see. How do I answer this? Um, first of all, I love that so many women are running. I am very curious if Joe Biden's gonna be in or out. I think Bloomberg is waiting to see if Biden's in or out to determine if Bloomberg's gonna jump in. Um, I, I'm really interested in how, like, uh, just looking at the, obviously all the Democrats, and there's so many, uh, you have all these, like Bernie was sort of the OG progressive, and now you have all these people who are espousing his very similar beliefs, and I'm sure, you know, he's now raised like six million dollars in a hot minute, and I'm sure he's like, whoa, this is my lane, like, who are you, you know? But I think it's interesting that a lot of people are jumping in on the Bernie train on a lot of that Medicare for all and free college tuition, but who really interests me in a different way is Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> Minnesota, tough, you know, there are all, there are stories about her, but I think the way she's answering the question about these you know, she has the highest turnover rate in the Senate of, of staff. You know, she, she t talked about throwing a binder and her response was, I didn't actually hate anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I think she really, in that part of the country, can really appeal. And I know she does appeal and it does amazing in her elections and appeals to the Democrat, but also the anti-Trump Republican. And depending on which way the Democrats go if they go, go more of like a progressive ilk or a, then there's the, the contrast is Klobuchar and I'm interested to watch her. I also am interested in Kamala Harris, but that's a whole other fascinating story about the black vote and Cory Booker and so exciting. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, and I know this is a very general question, but um, in all your experiences overseas, is there a very touching moment that you can recall yes. with the community, like not necessarily somebody famous that you were? Yes, they're all non-famous people, which to me are the most interesting interviews. And I would say, outside of being with Bobby or Rashad, our, my, my classmate, when I was like weeping, getting off this warship and having to go back after seeing my dear friend in the war on terror, um, I would say I was just in South Korea a little over a year ago and talk about a story that I had to fight-ish for. I mean, I get this amazing access from the U.S. Army, but, you know, when you're in the middle of the swirl of Washington, you know, I have to be like, guys, I got this amazing access, like, please let me go and let me off my show for a couple of days. So that's a boss question that I deal with. Then I go to South Korea, I fly into Seoul, I land on an aircraft carrier, thanks to Rashad and all of it, like, just talking to these people on this aircraft carrier, but it was sitting on a base um, with this dad who was in the military. And so, you know, and this was, just keep in mind, this is not, not when like there was this bromance happening with KJU and Trump where it was actually really just, he was a little rocket man and it was really horrible. And I was talking to all these people in Seoul who were saying to me, you know, people in South Korea are way more freaked out by Trump than Kim <laughs> Jong-un. And I was sitting in this, on base, talking to this military dad whose whole family, like they're from Texas and North Carolina, and this, he's been in for a while, and just like great salt of the earth people, little would I know, the wife went to UNC, it's like it's everywhere, and um, I'm sitting with him, and he's this tough guy, like we're around all this big heavy equipment the night before, and he's all tough with his soldiers, and then we're sitting in his home, and I start asking him about like, have you ever played out in your mind the moment of when the call comes in that the you-know-what is about to hit the fan and your family has to leave? And this guy, puddle of tears, all my, I'm with all guys on my crew. I hear them like sniffling in the background, you know, so touched by this moment, by this dad in the middle of South Korea who's taken his family all over the world but who in that moment, the thought of having to go to war because of something that's happening and he, ha he has to tell his family to get out and he won't know if he sees them again. And this is, this is it just was in a, it was in a, I'll never forget it. Hmm. Anyone else? Last one. Yes. Um, Sarah, is your friend 
just curious about your opinion on that. Yeah. Sorry, say it again. The recent hiring of CNN of Sarah, is it is her? Um, yes. Yes. Honestly, like, yeah, we're all, don't know, way above my pay grade. Don't know. On that note. <laughs> Thank you.